Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is December 9th, 2019, and this is part 20 of my video series, Mystery of the Beast. Today's video is how to come out of Babylon. I need to summarize quite a bit for people to be able to understand what I'm saying today. We have discovered that Satan's kingdom is now in a civil war. That Satan is fighting Satan. Satan is fighting Satan in terms of the beast warring against Babylon the Great. The beast, ultimately the beast includes all of mankind. Babylon the Great is the satanic spiritual entity that rules the hearts of men. Donald Trump is the eighth head of the beast, which is spoken of in Revelation chapter 17. And at the end of Revelation 17, we read this. And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw, where the prostitute is seated, are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose. By being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast, until the words of God are fulfilled... And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. At the beginning of chapter 17 of Revelation, we saw that the woman, who is called Babylon the Great and is a mystery, was riding the beast, just as a rider rides a horse and controls the horse with bit and bridle. So has the woman the satanic spiritual entity that rules the world, so has that woman controlled the beast, mankind, people like you and me. Donald Trump is the eighth prophetic head of the beast, the beast that was and is not at the time that John wrote the book of Revelation, but was going to come. It's because Donald Trump expressed his desire to destroy Babylon the Great. He called it other names. He's never used that term, Babylon the Great. But because he expressed his desire to destroy the deep state, if he became president, the deep state fought against him before he was president, conspired against him, created a coup against him after he was elected president and have continued to fight against him unmercifully since that time. We now are four years into the fight against Donald Trump. In turn, Donald Trump, since assuming the office of presidency, he has fought against Babylon the Great. In chapter 18 of the book of Revelation, we learn more about her. An angel cries, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. If you've been paying attention to alternative news, you will never hear this on the mainstream media because the mainstream media is part of Babylon the Great. But if you've been paying attention to other news sites, you understand the level of the depravity within Babylon the Great. You have heard about 
the sex trafficking of Jeff, Jeffrey Epstein. You've heard about Pedophile Island, his island. You've heard about the things that were done on that island that included some of the great political names of our world, like Bill and Hillary Clinton. You've heard about the satanic sacrifices. You've heard about the drinking of adrenochrome. You've heard about the torturing of young people, the sexual torturing and the, the actual torturing with knives and things that have produced adrenochrome for the members of Babylon the Great to drink. You've heard about the murders, the thefts, the atrocities. And I could name many, but hopefully you have heard about them and you know about them and they don't have to be repeated. Babylon the Great was the haunt, the dwelling place of demons. It still is because it still exists. It has not been destroyed yet. Verse 4 of Revelation 18 says, Come out of her, my people. This voice is coming from heaven. Speaking for God, if, if it's not the voice of God, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. This is a common theme in Scripture, and you see it over and over in the Old Testament and also in places in the New Testament besides the book of Revelation. The sad reality is that God's people have been part and parcel of Babylon the Great. They have committed many of the atrocities that we hear about. You've heard about the pedophile priests, the multitude of victims of the priests in the Catholic Church, but it's not limited to the Catholic Church. No names come to my mind right now of Protestant churches, but believe me, Protestant churches indulge in all sorts of sin as well as the Catholic churches. Christian people have been just as depraved, Christian Protestants just as depraved as the Catholics. And those people just as depraved as what we hear about things that happened on Jeffrey Epstein's island. But that's nothing new. In fact, it's written in the history of the church. It's written in the history in the Bible. I've taught you that all of the Bible is written as a parable. A parable is a story, and it could be an actual historical account like the accounts in the Old Testament, or it could be one of the stories, for example, that Jesus said when he taught his spiritual principles. But a parable is a story, whether historical or made up, that tells a prophetic truth. The Bible is like a seamless garment. It tells the same truth over and over and over again. Who is the beast? Well, why was Jesus born in a stable? Couldn't his father, couldn't God have pulled a few strings and gotten him, his, his mother, a room in the inn? Wasn't he interested in her comfort? Or was he more interested in something else? Why? Did Jesus have to be born in a stable? And why was he placed in a feeding trough? 
a feeding trough for beasts, for animals. It tells a story, you see. Jesus is to be our food and drink. Jesus himself said, my body is real food and my blood is real drink. And he offended almost everyone. And even today, Jesus offends almost everyone, doesn't he? Believe me, if Jesus came to your church, they would kick his butt out because they couldn't handle what he says. You think I'm joking? I have experience. I know what I'm saying. The beast does not like to hear the truth. So why then does this voice from heaven say to come out of Babylon, come out of her? Why doesn't he say come out of the beast? Because we can't. We can't come out. We cannot come out of our own flesh. We cannot change our own flesh. We can't. But someone can. The truth is that we must come to the place where we desire for that change to come, for that change to happen. We can only come out of Babylon when we change our minds about what is good, about what is evil, about what is true, about what is false. We can only come out of Babylon when we repent of the lives that we have lived and we truly decide to go another way in the way that Jesus has told us. That's how we come out of Babylon. Now, in the last video, I told you that the man of lawlessness has been revealed. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the man of lawlessness. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word, or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion, unless the divorcement, Some Bibles say apostasy. It's the word apostasia, which means a divorcement, a stepping away from a state of being. Unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. I believe that that has occurred. The man of lawlessness has been revealed. There's no clearer example of the man of lawlessness than what we see right now in the hearings happening in America's Congress. America that is supposed to be the land of the rule of law. But it's now the land of lawlessness as run by the Democrats. But the Republicans, they never really did any better until now. They never stood up for truth much until now. It's always been a show. It seemed like we were a nation of laws, but you know, the people who were really doing the dirty work, the people who were always getting the bribes, the people who were murdering those who would tell on them, they always got off. 
they're still getting off. But that day is coming to an end. Now, lest we become arrogant and think that only those who are part of Babylon the Great are the man of lawlessness, think again. Because many people who are fighting against the deep state are still lawless. They have joined President Trump's war against the deep state and therefore the war against Babylon the Great. But many are still lawless. Let's go on and look a little more about what Paul says about this lawlessness. Okay, this this man of lawlessness, this son of destruction, the word is perdition, like Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus was. He's a type. Judas is a type of us who betray Jesus. And we've all betrayed Jesus at one time or another. We've all betrayed God at one time or another. We've all been the man of lawlessness at one time or another. The question is, do we remain in the man of lawlessness or not? For that day will not come. That means the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So many of you believe that that is dealing with the third temple that you think is going to be built in Jerusalem, a third physical temple. And maybe, maybe a third temple will be built in Jerusalem, but this is not what this is talking about. This has nothing to do with a temple in Jerusalem. It has nothing to do with a physical temple. This is talking about us. We are the temple. We are the temple. And the man of lawlessness is the man who sets himself up in his own heart and says that he is the one who decides good and evil, that he is the one who makes the rules. who proclaims that he is God. And unfortunately, many people, even people in church, do that. Their churches have sets of rules that they made up that are not even anything that God would want as his rules. Paul goes on, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. Now is the time when the man of lawlessness has been revealed. We see him clearly for what he is. And there are those of you who loathe what you see, who loathe, for example, the Democrat Party that you used to be part of, that you used to partake of their sins with, and you now loathe them. Some of you have repented all the way and have followed Christ with a whole heart and actually seek to obey him. But others of you are carrying your sins, your particular sins, into service with Donald Trump. in an effort to fight against the deep state, fight against Babylon the Great, but you still are holding on to lawlessness in your own heart. Lawlessness is in both camps because this is a civil war. This is a civil war in the kingdom of Satan. It's a civil war between the beast and the harlot. And we see two camps, two distinct camps right now. So the beast is not righteous. 
Not yet. But the beast has been commissioned by God to destroy Babylon the Great. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. That's true for every single person except for those who do love the truth. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in righteousness. Now, it seems hopeless, doesn't it? It seems like there's no hopeless, I mean, there's no hope for this man of lawlessness. How do we come out of Babylon? How do we come out of Babylon? Let's read some things that Jesus said. Verse 10 of John. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them course this was a parable it was a figure of speech so jesus again said to them truly truly i say to you i am the door of the sheep all who came before me are thieves and robbers but the sheep did not listen to them i am the door if anyone enters by me he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture there is no other way That's the stumbling stone, isn't it? You think there's another way. You think you can be good enough? Or you think that you might become enlightened by Hindu or Buddhist teaching? Or by possibly Islamic teaching? You think there's another way in, but there is no other way. It's not that Jesus was a great teacher. It's that Jesus was God in the flesh. He was God in the flesh on earth. He came to men to explain to them how they could come out of Babylon. But he said there's only one door. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Who's the thief? Satan. He's a liar and a thief. And his kingdom is now being destroyed. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I laid down my life for the sheep. He was prophesying about his death. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Oh, really? So you mean others besides the Jews can come in? Yes, indeed. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, 
because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter. The Feast of Dedication begins soon. I believe it begins the weekend right before Christmas this year. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, Before I go on, yes, I know Christmas is based upon a pagan holiday. And in fact, I do not um, celebrate Christmas in my home. But believe me, that is the least of our problems and things to deal with these days. We have issues to deal with that are so big that Christmas is pretty low on that totem pole. Verse 24. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe me because you are not among my sheep. You are not among my sheep. The last 2,000 years has not been for the whole world. It's only been for his sheep. But yet it is true that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, John 3.16. So how can it be that there were people there who were not among his sheep? I thought, didn't you think that Jesus came to save everyone in the world? Well, yes, he did. But it happens in stages. And the first stage, after he was born, was the stage of calling out the Kodeshim, the Holy Ones, the Overcomers, the ones who would submit to being made like him while they were still under the rule of Satan's kingdom. It's not easy. When you, when you have to put up with deception daily to still want to follow the truth. Verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So they, they cannot lose their salvation, Okay. So, yes, once saved, always saved. That is true with respect to these people, with respect to the Kodeshim, because they are the, they are the ones who were specifically chosen to go on with Christ in this life, in this paradigm, because they are going to be the rulers of the world in the next paradigm, the ones who rule in the millennial kingdom, the ones who are the princes of the land who will then bring in the world. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the, out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Blasphemy, blasphemy, <clears throat> the Jews say. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man make yourself God. 
Yes, indeed, he did. He did. No question. There is no question. Jesus made himself out to be God. It seems like that reality kind of escapes a lot of Christians these days who believe that they're Christians and believe that they believe the tenets, the doctrines of the faith. Jesus is God. Jesus answered them. So he's answering their concern. You make yourself out to be God. Jesus answered them. Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? Is that there? Do you know where it is? I'll tell you in a minute. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? If I am doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. So where was it? Where did Jesus take the Pharisees when they accused him of blasphemy? He took them to Psalm 82. So let's read Psalm 82. A Psalm of Asaph. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Who's he talking to? Then he says, they have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. And then he says, I said you are God, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men you shall die and fall like any prince. Jesus told us that he was speaking to us. He was speaking to those to whom the word of God came. And we have had 6,000 years on this earth and we have judged unjustly. We have shown partiality to the wicked. We do not give justice to the weak and the fatherless. In fact, we kill the fatherless in the womb, don't we? We do not maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. We do not rescue the weak and the needy and we do not deliver them from the hand of the wicked. No, we show partiality to the wicked. That's why the wicked have grown richer and richer and have put this wor world under greater and greater bondage. But yet, we are the gods. We are the sons of the Most High that should have known better. We, the sons of Adam, became a mere beast. We should have known better, but we have acted like beasts. But God, in the face of Jesus Christ, knowing what we are and what we were then, came and was placed in a feeding trough as a sign that he was our food and our drink.
I believe I will end this video today with that. But we have much more to learn with respect to coming out of Babylon. The first lesson to take of how to come out of Babylon is this, is that you make Jesus Christ your food and your drink. That you learn how to eat the body and drink the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about these satanic witches and warlocks who actually do kill people and eat their bodies and drink their blood. That's how offensive the words were to the Jews who heard it, and they didn't know how to deal with it. Do you know how to deal with it? Jesus said, the words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. We are moving from the natural to the spiritual. It's time to change the focus of our minds from the natural to the spiritual, from the earthly to the heavenly. And we can do that only one way. And that is by focusing ourselves upon the words of Jesus Christ, upon the words of God, upon the word of God. I am the word. Jesus Christ is the word who became flesh. By him and through him were all things created. All things were created through him. The word spoke through the prophets of old. In the New Testament, the Bible says that Jesus said nothing unless he spoke with a parable. In the Old Testament, Jesus spoke through the prophets. Did he speak differently then? No, he spoke through a parable. All of the Bible tells the same story. And the story is about the beast being delivered from Babylon the Great. It is the story of the beast coming out of bondage to Satan into the glorious freedom of the sons of God. 